We next have a, uh, a law enforcement perspective because there are a lot of uh, people here who uh, do come from law enforcement and fortunately there are some tools we have right now that uh, when you get to a certain point and you cross some lines that our next two speakers are going to be speaking about, there are things that the law allows us to do. And, and I can promise you, for uh, Michael's sake, if, if nothing else, that uh, we're going to use them. But let's uh, first hear from the head of the DEA in Buffalo, New York. That's resident agent in charge, Dale Kasperzak. Uh, Dale is from Western New York and uh, actually attended, he's a graduate of UB, and attended and received a Bachelor of Science degree. After graduation, Mr. Kasperzak first began in local law enforcement, and I know we have a substantial number of uh, local police officers here, with the Reno Police Department in Nevada. He eventually rose from officer to the rank of lieutenant. In uh, 1989, Dale began service as a federal law enforcement officer, joining the DEA, and was assigned to the Buffalo office. Uh, Agent Kasperzak, then Special Agent Kasperzak, worked his way up first from Special Agent or Street Level Agent, then to Group Supervisor, and now ultimately to running the Buffalo Division. He's worked on every kind of narcotics case, uh, whether it be cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, and now pharmaceutical cases. Uh, Agent Kasperzak, uh, for his responsibilities, manages and supervisor, supervises two different enforcement groups, uh, several support units, including diversion investigators, analysts, investigative assistants, and forfeiture support personnel. And uh, on a personal note, I've got to tell you that it was uh, really through the hard work and persistence of Special Agent Kasberzak coming over to my office time and again that this conference has become the success, and frankly, this is the culmination of a lot of uh, resident agent in charge Kasberzak's inspiration. So I want to thank him on a personal note, but I'm really looking forward to what he has to say on a professional note. And with that, please welcome uh, resident agent Dale Kasberzak. Hey guys, could you activate the, uh, the handheld thing here? Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. That was very, very nice. Uh, before I begin, I, I want to take a minute to, to just reach out to my colleagues in law enforcement. You know, I spent the morning talking with many of you. Uh, I, I know the sheriff and undersheriff from Allegheny County is here. I saw state troopers here. Uh, people from ICE, ICE agents are here. Federal probation and parole is here. Uh, lots of state and local People are here, uh, investigators from the Attorney General's office are here. Really a, a wonderful showing of area and regional law enforcement here to discuss with us today and, and, and listen to us talk about this prescription drug problem. I, I want to thank you all for coming because you've helped me tremendously. You've helped us on those pill take backs. You've helped us on uh, joint investigations and, and, and really your your being here today, I think, says a lot. You're really embracing this problem and, and working with us to try to solve it. So I really want to want to thank you all. You know, sometimes for us to understand where we are today, we have to look back and, and, and look back to, to the years before to really understand the problem. And, and my frame of reference in law enforcement dates back over 30 years. So I'm going to go back to the early 80s and examine back in the early 80s and 70s uh, what was happening in our area throughout the United States when it comes to the drug of choice. And, and back in those days, the predominant drug of choice that was really uh, used and abused by a lot of people was heroin and opiates. Back in the 70s and 80s, that was what we saw on the streets of Buffalo. That's what we saw on the streets of many, many cities throughout the United States, heroin and opiates. 
And as you all know from listening to today's speakers, heroin is a significant and very dangerous painkiller. It's a Schedule I drug. There's really no medical use for heroin. It's a drug that's typically injected or snorted, but most often injected. It's a drug that many young people are afraid of, or at least were afraid of. And as we moved through the 70s and into the 80s, things began to change. And, and we in law enforcement saw this shift. And these shifts, these changes come so slowly that sometimes it's almost imperceptible. But we saw this, this change, this cycle, so to speak, of drug to choice. And it changed from the opiates and the painkillers to the stimulants. The 80s saw a dramatic rise in the use of cocaine. And eventually from cocaine, people transitioned to crack cocaine. And it's probably no coincidence that that rise in cocaine use coincided with the rise in availability. It's also probably no coincidence that in the 80s, there, there was this organization of drug sellers and distributors in South America. You know them today as cartels. And these cartels began to get organized. And, and, and they ran their drug distribution networks and organizations much like a big business. And they got involved with the production of cocaine. They got involved with the, the uh, smuggling of cocaine from South America up into the United States. And that really increased the availability of that drug in the US. What we saw from law enforcement was this rise in cocaine use. And along with that, we saw a diminishing opiate use. That was the 80s and the 90s. I, I call it the, the uh, opiates versus stimulants cycle of abuse. And, and I have to, to tell you all, I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm a, I'm a policeman, really. And, and this chart that we put together really isn't very scientific, but I, I did it to, to really try to to bring the point home to you all. That oftentimes what we see in law enforcement is this use of one drug that becomes very popular and this decrease in another drug that had been popular. And we have seen that with opiate-based drugs versus stimulants. Throughout the 80s, we saw a lot of cocaine and crack being used and being sold in this area. Things have changed. Now it's interesting to note those same Colombian cartels that I've described to you, back in the 80s, they exclusively produced cocaine. In the 90s, they began to change a little bit. They began to grow the opium poppy. Interestingly, the opium poppy grows really well in South America. They began to grow that poppy, they began to produce heroin. At first, it wasn't good high-quality heroin, but they sold it very cheap. Compared to the heroin that was being smuggled into the U.S. from Southeast and Southwest Asia, Colombian heroin was about half the price. Half the price. But the Colombians obviously knew something. They knew that for them to be effective as businessmen, they needed to continue to sell cocaine, but also consider opening up their markets into other areas. Maybe they knew about this cycle of abuse. Either way, they certainly have capitalized on it. Now, moving forward, we are in the year 2011. We have seen a dramatic change, dramatic change on the streets of Western New York with respect to the drugs that are available to people. You know, cocaine is still there, crack cocaine is still there, heroin is certainly there, but, but this, the oxy, the fentanyl, the oxymorphone, which is opana, the suboxone, the hydrocodone, this is a change. And, and earlier this morning, you, you heard uh, Dr. Updike talk a little bit about that perfect storm. I, I, I would suggest to you, and if we go back to this, this uh, cycle of abuse that I showed you earlier, I would suggest to you that that perfect storm uh, uh, of circumstances began to develop in the 1990s. And, and what I mean by that is this. Doctors in the 90s really began to treat pain differently than they had previously treated pain. 
doctors began to prescribe more opiates more aggressively. As that was going on, Colombians began to really produce heroin. And, and not just produce it, but produce it and sell it cheap. Cheap. So what we, what we saw happen is this, this increase in pharmaceuticals being available on the streets and an increase in cheap heroin being available on the streets. And the end result of all that was we have a much stronger opiate problem today than we did back in the 80s. And leading it off are prescription drugs. Let's talk about this very specifically. I know it's been touched upon, but I really want to drive this point home for all of you so you understand if you're a person on the street and you're buying uh, opiate drugs, this is typically how things go. And, and for those of you in the, in the treatment arena, I, I think you'll all agree with this. This is how it all happens. It begins with hydrocodone. Hydrocodone is cheap and it's available everywhere. People can buy hydrocodone tablets on the street for 2 to $3 a pill. That begins that, that, that addiction uh, journey. And, and, and look, it, you, you don't necessarily have to get hydrocodone illegally. Sometimes you, you, you get it through a prescription and you develop that addiction. And instead of being able to, to stop, you continue building up a tolerance for the drug. The next thing you know, you jump into Oxycontin. And, and I prepared this slide about a year ago, right around the time when Purdue uh, was contemplating and then eventually did the reformulation. The reformulation has helped. It has helped. For the average user, not being able to crush the Oxycontin cap tablet in your car right after you've purchased it is a big deal because that's what was happening. Oxycontin users would buy that pill. They wouldn't even be able to get it home to use it. They would sit in their car, they'd crush it up, and they'd snort it right in the car. So the reformulation has helped. But of course, it hasn't eliminated the problem because now instead of going to, uh, to Oxycontin, oftentimes people will transition to fentanyl or Opana. Oxymorphone now is one of the most popular drugs. And we talked about heroin. We've talked about the price of heroin dropping. Those of you know, that know this, this cycle of abuse, you're developing a tolerance. It takes more and more of the drug to get high. Eventually, drug users will turn to heroin. Heroin is cheap. Here on the streets of Buffalo, you can buy a bag of heroin for $10. $10. Why pay $40 or $50 for an Oxycontin or Opana tablet if you can get a bag of heroin for $10? Some of the young people that have talked today, Samantha has talked today and talked about her drug of choice being heroin. Many of the young people that I know and that I've talked to who have had drug issues all eventually transition to heroin. Some don't start by injecting it, some start by snorting it. Heroin is formulated much more stronger today than it had been in years past. We talk about how bad this drug problem can be here in western New York, and, and I had the intel guys from my office pull some, some very, very sobering statistics, and these came from ECMC. Look at, look at the numbers here, folks. Look at the number of people that are overdosing. These are deaths in 2009. So these are people that actually have passed away because of overdoses. Prescription opiates, 41 of them. 41, more than half, were because of prescription opiates. Sobering. That was 2009. Now we're into 2011. Has the problem got any better? I don't think so. Uh, from January to June of 2011, the first six months of this year, of the 863 ER visits for uh, overdoses, 629 were opiate-related, almost 73%. 73%, folks. It's not good. There's lots of reasons why people turn to prescription drugs. Lots of reasons. You know, I, I think there's a general consensus amongst drug users that prescription drugs are safe. I, I think they feel that because they're prescribed, because doctors and other medical professionals 
can issue them, that there is a measure of safety. And, and I guess in some sense there is. I mean, cocaine and heroin, methamphetamine, these are drugs that are oftentimes produced in jungle laboratories. They're not produced by pharmaceutical companies. There is no quality control, no safety measures. People, drug users, are very smart and savvy. They're educated in the sense that they know what they're doing and they know the drug that they're going after. They're smart about it. They feel a little safer starting out and taking prescription drugs. They're oftentimes easy to obtain through legal scripts. You know, I, I, I've been out and, and I've talked to a lot of different doctor groups. I hope that there's some doctors here today. I think there are. Uh, it, they, people will come in and dupe you. We have seen it in some of our cases. I'll talk about one of those cases later on. They will come in and, and dupe you. They will lie to you to get the drugs. And, and once that happens and once they get on a script, then it's off to the races for them. Legitimate injury or illness leads to addiction. You know, Dr. Updike really, really covered this point very, very well. It happens every day. Uh, it, I, I think doctors, for the most part, are really trying to deal with it, but it is a problem. And, and then finally, you know, I, I think there's a sense amongst drug users that it's safer and that the police aren't really looking at them if they have pills in their pocket, particularly if the pill bottle has their name on it. Let's talk for a minute about some of the cases that we've worked and some of the means and methods by which folks out there on the streets can get prescription drugs. And I have to, to caution you all, and I will say this because Mr. Hochul will, will really uh, be nervous if I don't say this, that some of the cases that I'm going to talk about involve real people, real events, uh, people that are being prosecuted by his office. And I have to, to acknowledge and say and admonish everyone that these are people that are, are, are considered innocent until proven guilty. So I, I just want everybody to understand that. And I'm going to talk in very general terms, but I, I want to give you a flavor of what we're seeing. Up at the top, I have doctor shoppers and organized script rings. And, and, and the case that, that really comes to mind when I, when I talk about that issue is the Michael McCall case. Uh, it's an investigation that we worked in 2009. It's a wiretap case, actually. And, and Mike McCall was, uh, we believe, the leader of that organization. A man that really uh, commanded great respect on the east side of Buffalo. A man that was very organized and, and had at his fingertips no less than 80 to 90 different individuals that were seeing doctors on his behalf that he was buying scripts from. Mr. McCall was ingenious. If he was running a legitimate business and put all of his hard efforts to that, he might be a wealthy man, but instead he chose to traffic pharmaceuticals. McCall would go often to doctor's offices and sometimes sit in the waiting room of doctor's offices there to try to recruit new people so that he could buy their pain medication from them. An incredible story, an incredible case. The majority of the people that we have arrested in that case, the majority have pled guilty. And, and, and this, this happens. And, and I talked earlier about doctors getting duped. We heard that sort of conversation on the wiretaps. We heard people call up McCall and say, what do you want me to say to this doctor? And he would coach them through the process and explain to, to them what to say to the doctor, how to say it, how to beat the urine test, how to beat the system, essentially, so that they could obtain hydrocodone, oxycotton, opana, fentanyl, which he would then buy and sell out on the street. This case really demonstrates the need for a prescription monitoring program here in New York State and really throughout the country. We've talked about it. You must all know that, that New York State does have a, 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 a prescription monitoring system. It is a very mild system. It is not a real-time system. What doctors need is the ability to take that patient, put that patient's name, 
and information into a computer system and have that computer tell them right there as they sit in front of the patient, have that computer tell them what doctors they've seen, what scripts they have, and exactly what they're being treated for. Because patients will lie. Patients won't tell you that they just came back from the doctor up the street or that they just visited a doctor in Rochester or Erie, Pennsylvania. They will lie. They will go to six, seven, eight different doctors and make up different stories just so they can get additional Oxycontin that either they can take themselves or sell to people like Michael McCall. Oh, the next one, and, and really, I, I have to tell you all, they're not up in any particular order as we go through these, all right? So just because the prescribers, dispensers of, of prescription drugs are up second, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that that's where they rank. Uh, doctors and medical professionals have a responsibility in, in this whole situation. They have a responsibility to treat people using normal accepted guidelines of medicine. We would expect that from doctors, and I think doctors, for the most part, expect that out of themselves. There's a very, very small percentage of doctors that are out doing the kinds of things that Dr. Mehta was doing. I will tell you that Dr. Mehta's behavior was so egregious, it was generally considered by many to be off the charts. And, and his actions were, were reported to us by a number of sources. Other doctors called about Dr. Mehta. Pharmacists called about Dr. Mehta. Hospitals called about Dr. Mehta. The police called about Dr. Mehta. Do you know even drug addicts that were going to Dr. Mehta called about Dr. Mehta? I say this to you because I want the doctors in the audience to understand that this is not a witch hunt. We are not here in law enforcement pointing the finger at you. We are not. Meta is an example of someone that really kind of ventured way off course, and, and, and now he's paying the price for that. If you venture off course, rest assured, we will find you and hunt you down. If you don't venture off course and you do what we know you're capable of doing, you will never have a problem with, with law enforcement. Never. Internet pharmacies. There's been some change in, in the way internet pharmacies are regulated. Uh, federal legislation uh, in the, in, in the, in the mid-2000s really uh, affected their ability to sell controlled substances over the internet. It used to be that you could go online and fill out an online questionnaire, talk about whatever illness you might have. Maybe, maybe the online doctor would email you, maybe not, but at the end of the day, you'd get your script for, for painkillers. That has since changed. And so we've seen a, a significant reduction in the type of, uh, of investigations that we're doing now with respect to online pharmacies. Pharmacy robberies and burglaries. Th this is dangerous stuff, folks. I, I, I mean, I, I can't drive the point home any better than maybe talking briefly about that event that happened down in Long Island. I don't know whether it was uh, earlier in the year where, where a, a guy came in and I think shot and killed three people in, in a pharmacy. Thankfully, we haven't had that happen up here. But we have had our fair share of pharmacy robberies. And, and typically what we see is drug addicts, people who, who just really crave the drug, have an opiate addiction. We, we see them uh, kind of full of piss and vinegar because they are drug addicts, and they decide that they're going to go out and rob a pharmacy. And more times than not, they are armed with weapons. More times than not, they go in with an organization. They have uh, uh, getaway drivers, they have people on, that, that go in the stores to, to, to case the place, to have lookouts available. They really are very sophisticated when they do it. They do it with, with the idea that they're going to go in there and get a lot. And once they get all that, they're going to put it out on the streets and they're going to sell it. We've been very fortunate. We have collaborated with local law enforcement on a number of these cases. 
we've been very fortunate because the U.S. Attorney's Office here is elected to prosecute a number of these cases. And the jail time that these defendants are looking at is significant. So we are making a dent, and we're trying to get the message out. Forge and altered prescriptions. There, there's probably not a week that, that goes by where we don't get a call from a doctor's office in which they complain to us about scripts that have gone missing or employees of their facilities that have taken the scripts and, and written them to, to uh, obtain different opiate-based pharmaceuticals. And, and, and folks, really it boils down to one thing and one thing only, it's greed. The, these employees steal these scripts so they can go out and make fast money. There is a tremendous market for Oxycontin and for Opana right now. If you can get your hand on a 90-day supply, you know what? You can probably pay your rent for the month or your car payment or your mortgage payment. And that's what we're oftentimes seeing. Package theft and diversion. And we talk about UPS, DHL, FedEx. We've had some interesting calls, uh, most recently from UPS. And, and I say this because I, I oftentimes wonder if people are just dumb sometimes. You know, they're, they're working in these facilities. UPS is, is, is a classic one. I mean, everything in UPS, if you're working in, in an area where you are uh, sifting through the boxes, those are all videotaped, and there's cameras everywhere, so they can see exactly what you're doing. And these package handlers will, will look at packages that are marked going to a pharmacy. No real you know, surprise here. They take those packages and they pop them open and they see what's in there. So, you know, we've been very fortunate because we work very closely with UPS security and, and most of those folks have been arrested almost immediately. And it gets back to what I described earlier with respect to, to people stealing scripts. More times than not, it isn't that the UPS employee is addicted to one of these narcotics. More times than not, it's all about making money and they steal those narcotics because they know there's a market for them out, out in the streets. International smuggling. Uh, we're unique here in Buffalo. We, we are right on the Canadian border, and, and we just wrapped up a case last week, uh, a, a case in which two people, uh, Joseph Julian and Kevin Hinka, were both arrested for their involvement in an Oxycontin distribution organization Mr. Hinka is from Lancaster Depew. He had set up shop there. We believe he was selling Oxycontin to a variety of people in the eastern suburbs. Mr. Julian is from southern Ontario. Now, it's interesting to note that Oxycontin that's sold in Ontario is not the reformulated Oxycontin. It's the Oxycontin that still can be crushed and snorted. Joseph Julian knew that. He had a source for Oxycontin. He began bringing it across the international border. He sold it to Mr. Hinka. He, he was able to market that Canadian Oxycontin here in the western New York area for more than a dollar a milligram. He was selling 80 milligram pills for $100 on the street. It's an incredible profit. So Hinka had the organization to sell it. Julian had the organization to get it and bring it here. It was a noteworthy case. And, and really a, a good case that, that not only demonstrated cooperation amongst law enforcement here locally, but also cooperation internationally. We, we worked uh, a lot with the, uh, the BEST team, and they have representatives from Niagara Regional Police. We were able to execute search warrants up in Canada on Julian's residence. Really a, a wonderful example of cooperative police work, which ended up uh, locking up both Julian and Henke. Another quick point to note here. Uh, you may or may not have had a chance to, to meet him. He had to leave. John Gilbride was here, and John Gilbride is my former boss. He had been the special agent in charge of the New York Field Division. He left DEA about three weeks ago to join Purdue Pharmaceutical. Interesting job change. Uh, but, you know, we had some discussions about this case in particular over the last week. And uh, he wanted me to tell you all 
that, that Purdue Pharmaceutical is actually divided up into, into a couple of different corporations, Canada being separate from the U.S. But based upon this case and others like this, Purdue Canada has now decided that they are going to reformulate OxyContin sold in Canada so that it is consistent with the OxyContin that is sold here in the U.S. So in some small way, that is a victory for us in law enforcement because that hopefully will prevent this type of cross-border smuggling of OxyContin. Finally, theft of drugs from families' medicine cabinets. Most of the young people that I've talked to that get addicted to medications admit that they first obtain those medications from their family's medicine cabinets. That, that is a preventable event. I, we don't even think about it sometimes. I, I know I have medications laying around in my house. I often never even thought about it. I do now, and I hope all of you do. We have uh, organized and, and had many, three now, of these uh, pill take-back events. You've heard them talked about. They are, are so critical for us to get those medications out of people's homes and destroyed. And it's a great way for those of us in law enforcement to get the message out about this terrible problem. What are we doing in law enforcement? You know, the theme of today's program is a call to action. And, and I want you all to know that we have embraced that theme now for many, many months. At the DEA, we have really recognized that prescription drug abuse is a significant problem, not just locally, but nationally. We have met with all of the different representatives of narcotic squads here in this area. I've gone out and met with a lot of the different drug commanders, the drug investigators, we're, we're trying to give, convince everyone that these pharmaceutical type cases, these pill cases, should be given the same level of priority as a cocaine case, a crack cocaine case, or a heroin case. They have acknowledged, these drug units have acknowledged to me that sometimes more than half of their undercover buys are for prescription drugs. So I think that message is being received at least at the law enforcement level. As a manager of drug units, I, I will tell you all that it is sometimes very difficult to convince drug investigators to work on a specific priority. Telling a drug investigator, I need you to go out there and make Oxycontin cases, is not that easy. Oftentimes, drug cases are driven by the quality and the type of informants that we have. If we arrest someone who's a cocaine trafficker, typically, typically he's going to give you information about other cocaine traffickers, although we are seeing now a lot of polydrug organizations starting to crop up, mainly because prescription drugs are so profitable. But, but really, drug investigators will go where their informants take them. And we as managers have to try to direct those activities into areas where we think are best going to help our communities. We have to strike a balance. I want to talk a little bit about prosecutors. I am very fortunate at the federal level, very, very fortunate. The U.S. Attorney's Office has been splendid in, in really putting these, these uh, uh, drug pill cases through. I see he's sneaking up on me. Am I? <laughs> you know, I, I have to tell you, it, me staying on time is almost impossible. So, so the, him him doing this is really kind of pushing me along. But they've been great in, in really uh, uh, keeping uh, keeping these cases alive. We have to get that same message out to some of the state and locals as well. Okay, here in Buffalo, we have put together this tactical diversion squad. I'm going to end on this. Uh, they're a fantastic group of guys and gals. Uh, they're here today. I'm not going to ask them to stand up, but I do want to just take a minute to talk about some of the different agencies that have representation on that squad. The Buffalo Police Department, the Lancaster Police Department, the Amherst Police Department, and the Erie County Sheriff's Department have all pledged and given us investigators to work on this squad. Their job is to focus on pharmaceutical cases and, and 
people that may or may not, you know, be selling drugs that are doctors or other licensed medical professionals. They are hitting it out of the park, folks. And uh, they're all here today. If you get a chance to meet with them after this summit or during the summit, I would encourage that. Uh, exchange cards with them, get some information from them, and, and please work with them uh, as soon as you can. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, putting up with me.